Greetings, people. Um, my name is Misha Hookstra, a.k.a. Minka Hoist. And today we're gonna, we're gonna go um, around. We're gonna go to hell and back in different ways. Uh, these first few songs I'm gonna do here give some vision of the afterlife. And um, then I'll do a bit of reading and then we'll spend some time in hell and some more reading and um, let's see if we can make some sense of it all. So this first song uh, is told, um, it concerns a grandfather's vision of his grandson um, who is headed for a sort of traditional hell he thinks and yellow tree leaves laugh like water Tall grass is bowing ways. You're the son of some preacher's daughter. The preacher's rolling in his grave. You say he never saw the ocean. No wrote letters on a screen Autumn breezes cause commotion These are the worst you've ever seen Turn Turn the soil black red mud drifts like oil drips tastes like blood. Your day's peeling off like paper Night spent feeling phantom pain But all your promises Have turned vapor And all your pleasures They are vain Turn, turn the soil Black, red, mud Drips like oil Tastes like He tried so hard to prepare you for a life you'll never lead. But short term jobs and lovers snare you. You'll raise no stone, you'll plant no seed. Turn, turn the soil 
black red mud. Drips like oil. Tastes like blood. Turn, turn the soil. Black, red, mud. Drips like oil. Tastes like blood. <clears throat> so I'm a little bit more out of my comfort zone this week. Uh, these uh, include a bunch of older songs that I haven't really played much in a while. So bear with me if there's a few, a few mistakes. Uh, the next song is one I wrote with this awesome dude from England by the name of Wolfred Scott. And it, um, it takes place in a funeral parlor, as a lot of songs do, and it concerns um, somebody who sees an old friend they haven't seen that this person hasn't seen for decades since they were young kids with um, the person in the casket whose name is Emily. It's really good to see you again Been some years This dress looks real pretty Thought there'd be more here She looks good considering what brings us here, childhood so far away. Childhood so far away, playing kiss and chase, you me, what's his face, Emily. We'll have another chance. If I stand, my eyes closed, she is right here. Her girl smile, her wild laugh, they ring so clear, childhood so far away. Playing kiss and chase, you me, what's his face, Emily? Childhood so far away, playing kiss and chase, you me, what's his face, Emily? Emily. Didn't she have a Emily, no, none that I can see. Guess it's just you and me. Say goodbye to Emily. So alive, Emily. 
so alive, Emily, so alive, Emily, so alive, Emily, childhood so far away, playing and kiss and chase, you me, what's his face, Emily. And uh, the last uh, one before I'm going to put down this guitar um, is a song about somebody who's stuck in a sort of limbo, uh, a limbo after celebrity. Something I'm sure we all have a lot of symp sympathy for. <laughs> Upside down Hollywood Where the stars come to rest Her skid marks are salted away Probably for the best So, upside down Hollywood, where the stars, they break their fall, she flares her, she drains another thermos cup, feeling four feet tall. Love for her is poison, oh. It gets worse every time. She tells herself another joke. Leaves out the final line. Upside down Hollywood A bacon soda town She dreams of being Robin Hood Feels more like Charlie Brown She runs into a mirror Bangs her nose real bad Undecorates her interior Uncorks a memory of her dad Upside down Hollywood Where the stars They all burn out She flares up for a
So, I can't see any comments, but that's all right. <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, another short piece this week from Hans Christian Andersen. This one was the bonus, the bonus little story that filled out this volume that came out in um, the spring in the United States and last fall in England from the remarkable Pushkin Press. And this is of a classical journey to hell. It's traditionally translated as the steadfast tin soldier. Uh, most kids these days don't know the word steadfast and it's kind of an abstract concept. So we, um, I went with the true hearted tin soldier. Once upon a time, there were 25 tin soldiers. They were brothers because they were all sons of an old tin spoon. Each one held a rifle and looked straight in front of him and their splendid uniforms were red and blue. The very first thing they ever heard was when the lid was lifted from the box where they lay. Tin soldiers, shouted a little boy and he clapped his hands. They were a present for him because it was his birthday. And now he set them up on the table. Every soldier looked exactly like his brothers, except for one who was a bit different. This soldier had only one leg because he was the last to be cast and there hadn't been quite enough tin Yet he stood just as steady on his one leg as the others on their two. And it's this soldier who would become something marvelous. There were lots of other toys on the table where they were placed. But what caught the eye was an attractive paper castle. Through the tiny windows, you could see right into its rooms. Outside the castle, little trees stood around a small mirror that was supposed to look like a lake where wax swans swam in their own reflections. It all looked very pretty, but prettiest of all was the young dancer who stood in the middle of the castle's open doorway. She was also cut out of paper, but she was wearing a skirt of gauzy linen and a little blue sash across her shoulder, like a scarf. In the middle of the sash was a shiny spangle as large as her face. The dancer stretched out both arms, for she was a ballerina, and she raised one of her legs so high in the air that the tin soldier couldn't see it and thought she had only one leg, just like him. That's the wife for me, he thought. But she looks rather elegant and lives in a castle, while I only have a box. And there are 25 of us living here. Not a place for her. Yet, I must try to introduce myself. His tall body was hidden behind a snuff box. Here he could gaze upon the fine little dancer, who kept standing on one leg without losing her balance. Late in the evening, all the other tin soldiers were put into their box, and the people of the house went to bed. Now the toys started to play charades, fight battles, and hold dances. The tin soldiers rattled in their box because they wanted to get out but couldn't get the lid off. The nutcracker turned somersaults, the chalk played tricks on the slate, and they all made such a racket that it woke the canary who began talking in rhyme. The only toys who didn't budge were the tin soldier and the ballerina. She stayed upright on tiptoe with both her arms spread. He was just as steady on his single leg and his eyes didn't leave her for a moment. Then the clock struck 12 and smack, 
the lid of the snuff box popped off. But there was no snuff inside, no snuff tobacco at all. No, for up jumped a little black goblin, a jack-in-the-box. Tin soldier, warned the goblin, keep your eyes to yourself. But the tin soldier acted as if he hadn't heard. Well then, said the goblin, just you wait till tomorrow. When morning came and the children got up, they placed the tin soldier on the windowsill. And it's not clear if it was because of the goblin or a gust of wind. But the window flew open, and the soldier tumbled head first from the third floor. He fell terribly fast, his leg in the air, and landed bang on his cap, his bayonet jammed between the cobblestones. The young maid and the little boy rushed down to look for him immediately. But though they very nearly stepped on him, they didn't see him. If the tin soldier had shouted, I'm here, they probably would have found him. But he didn't think it proper to yell because he was in uniform. Now it started raining, and each drop came quicker than the one before until it was coming down in buckets. And when it stopped, two young mischief makers came by. Ahoy! The first boy called out, a tin soldier, time for him to join the Navy. Then they made a boat out of newspaper, put the tin soldier in it, and sent him sailing down the gutter. The boys ran alongside, clapping their hands. My goodness, what waves there were in that gutter, and what a current. For remember, it had just rained buckets. The paper boat rocked up and down and spun around so quickly the tin soldier started to sake. Yet he stayed standing and didn't blink, just looked straight ahead and held on to his rifle. Suddenly, the boat rushed into a long tunnel where planks covered the gutter. It was just as dark in there as inside his box. Where am I? he wondered. This is the goblin's doing. If only the young dancer were sitting here in the boat, then I wouldn't mind if it were twice as dark. Just then, there appeared a huge water rat who lived in the gutter beneath the planks. Passport, demanded the rat, hand it over. But the tin soldier said nothing. He just gripped his rifle even tighter. The boat kept moving with the rat right behind. Ooh, how it gnashed its teeth. And then it shouted to the floating sticks and straws, Stop him! Stop him! He hasn't paid the toll! He hasn't shown his passport! But the current started moving faster and faster, and now the tin soldier could see daylight where the planking ended. Yet he could also hear a roaring sound ahead of him that would scare the bravest of men. And soon he could see the gutter dropping away at the end of the tunnel, where the water fell into a large canal. It looked dangerous, as dangerous as the edge of a high waterfall would look to you. But now it was so, clo so close that he couldn't stop. The boat shot out of the tunnel, and the poor tin soldier held himself as stiff as a board. No one could say he moved a muscle. Then the boat splashed down, spun around three times, and began to fill with water up to the brim. It was sinking. Soon the tin soldier was standing in water up to his neck, and as the boat sank deeper and deeper, the newspaper started to come apart. As the water closed over the soldier's head, he thought of the delightful ballerina whom he'd never see again. A children's song echoed in his ear. Danger, danger, man of war, you shall suffer death. Then the paper split open, and the tin soldier fell through the bottom, right into the mouth of an enormous fish. Oh, but it was so dark inside. It was even worse than under the planks, and so cramped. But the tin soldier steeled himself, and he lay there in the fish, as straight as a ramrod, 
and gripped his rifle tight. The, sw the fish swam every which way, and its movement squeezed the tin soldier dreadfully. After a long, long time, though, it stopped moving and became quite still. Then something flashed through it like a bolt of lightning. Bright light was everywhere, and someone shouted, A tin soldier! For the fish had been caught, sold in the market, and brought up to a kitchen, where a young woman had sliced it open with a large knife. Now she grabbed the tin soldier by the waist with two fingers and carried him into a room where everyone wanted to see the amazing man who had traveled in the belly of a fish. Yet the tin soldier did not feel proud. They placed him up on a table and there, oh, what strange things happen in this world. For the tin soldier found himself in the very same room as before. He saw the very same children and the very same toys on the table, including the pretty castle with the beautiful ballerina. She was still standing on one leg with the other in the air, for she had stayed faithfully upright too. This touched the tin soldier, and he almost wept tin tears, but that would never do. He looked at her, and she looked at him, and neither of them said a word. Suddenly, one of the small boys grabbed the tin soldier and threw him into the wood-burning stove. He didn't say why, but it must have been the goblin's fault. The tin soldier stood inside the stove, all lit up, and he felt a terrible heat. But whether it came from fire or from love, he didn't know. His bright colors were all gone now, though no one could say if it was because of his long journey or simply because of his sorrow. He gazed at the young dancer, and she gazed at him, and he felt that he was melting. Yet still he stood upright with his rifle in his hand. Then a door opened, and the wind caught the dancer. She flew through the air like a sylph, straight to the tin soldier in the stove. She flared up in the fire and was gone. Then the tin soldier melted into a metal blob. The next day, when the maid came to take out the ashes, she found he'd become a small tin heart. But the only thing left of the ballerina was her spangle, and that was burnt black as coal. Skull. So I promised we'd spend a little time in hell, or at least the underworld. What to say about these? Um, this first is a song I wrote with Dan Plews, and um, it's a, it's a sort of hell. It's it moves from date rape to harassment to complicity. calendar he softly breathes and takes her by the hand takes off her skirt and blouse she lies back eyes closed breathes out and 
when it's done, her stocking feet are feeling for her shoes. Her hair falls all around, undone she leaves, breaks down. Back at school, they gather round and pin her to the wall. Her page is turning now. She counts the days, the weeks. But even if it turns around, she's paper thin and he would look right through her. Apart from there, where focal dark there's a shadow on her heart, the calendar girl. Miss Calendar, so glad you're here. Just follow me this way. Remove that paper gown, relax, breathe in, breathe out. And when it's done, her stocking feet are feeling for her shoes. Her hair falls all around, undone she leaves breaks down Men in group they gather round round table and high chair Remo They pin her up They gaze at her image on the wall But she's so thin the light it shines right through Apart from there, where focal darkness falls, there's a shadow on their hearts, the calendar girl. Slouching boys, we sit and laugh Round table and low chair We trace the curves we dig We strike our lines Through her days, through her months And through her years We flip it closed and then we're free of her Apart from there Where focal darkness falls there's a shadow on our hearts it's the calendar girl calendar girl calendar It's 9 p.m. where I am. It may be noon where some of you are, but I don't feel bad about having a beer.
This is about being at the bottom um, and realizing that you are hiding from the world and the most you can hope for is for the world to see you anyway. This beast hides in its shell This beast lives underground This beast flies a false flag This beast will not be found Long wet beast hides in its shell. What beast lives underground? What beast flies a false flag? What beast will not? be found this man covers his face this man stifles his sound this man wipes out all trace this man fears he will be found Long to burst from this shell Long to stand my own ground Long to fly my true colors Long for this beast to be found. I long for this beast to be found. I long for this beast to be found. So there's a So hell sometimes is paralysis, right? It's five in the morning. two people. They both know that they need to make a break with the other. They both know that the other one knows. But they're both afraid to say the first word like two songbirds sitting on a branch in the middle of the night in the drizzling rain afraid to make a peep waiting for the dawn
we listen for someone to make crack a word. The glisten of rain on two tongueless birds. This prison despairing of ever being heard. I am chill We wait for one old bell To ring in the day We're touching a frame of ever letting go. Claws clutching this dead branch of the old sycamore. I am searching the skies and your face for a trace of code while he Ring in the day. Our breathing is falling strangely in sync. Wings beating, hearts quailing on the lip of the brain. I am seeing the skies and your face slip a link into the sea. One cracked bill to ring in the day. I am seeing the links of this chain slip and sink. Uh, so, long before 
I started translating stuff I did, or writing songs for that matter. I did some writing myself. And in my 30s, Excuse me. In my 30s, I wrote an experimental novel by the name of The Joy of Edge Tools. And I'm going to read the opening of it because it's the first paragraph. It's a long first paragraph. Although it concerns and describes a birth for the main character a little boy named Adkin. It's um, hellacious because it's the birth of his nemes nemesis, uh, the person who's going to become his arch enemy. And it's clear already to him from the start. So, from the Joy of Edge Tools, this is the first section of the first chapter called The Brother, and there's a little epigraph for the chapter. A brother is like one shoulder. Somali proverb. I am playing in the sandbox when my mother calls me in. Opening the screen door, I see a dozen spirit and seltzer bottles on the floor where my mother, whose head is in the cupboard beneath the kitchen sink, has been setting them behind her. They clank as she uses each new bottle to push the others back. At last, her head emerges, and she stands with a squat celadon jar cradled in the crook of her left arm. She pops off the wire bale that secures the lid, disclosing a gray, cottony growth inside. Take off your shirt, my mother says, and turn around. She plunges two long fingers deep into the jar and spreads some stinky green matrix upon my right shoulder blade. It is cold and it smarts and I protest. She bends to the spot and hawks on it. <clears throat> Very soon, this brings a boil, but she will not lance it. I begin to pick at it, and she chuckles, binds my wrist to my belt buckle with a length of twine from the toolbox on the table. The pressure in my shoulder increases, and I feel something begin to pinch and gnaw at the bone. It is swollen to the size of a songbird's egg. It grows heavy and painful. I snap at the lump, but only succeed in losing my balance, falling to my knees and then my left side. Be careful with that, she says to me over the noise of what she replaces under the sink. Be kind. You might as well start now. But the growth asks smashing. It hurts like nothing I have known. It is now the size of a fist. With my hands bound, I cannot rise. I can only roll about and grind my shoulder into the floor. My mother shuts the door after the last bottle but one, which she brings over with the toolbox to set gently on the linoleum next to my head. From the toolbox, she extracts a chrome lighter, a clean folded pair of cotton panties, and an exacto knife. A tender, bemused smile lights her face. She places these items on the floor so that they are equidistant from and parallel to the length of the toolbox. And then, grunting as she strains her small frame to do so, she pulls me over onto my stomach so that my horizon is now dominated by the brushed steel face of the gaping box. I twist so I can see her and then do my best to bellow trying to register my discomfiture in her countenance. She brushes a strand of hair from her brow. The pain is excruciating in general. Something moves violently in my shoulder, the size now of a softball or a gravy boat, the skin stretched as tight as a tea kettle. Hold still, she says, introducing the panties into my mouth. 
bite down on this. It is almost a relief to do so. With my mother's left knee in the small of my back, I can, little, I can move little more than my eyes. When she lays her hand on the hump, it stops its furious quivering though it retains my shoulder bone in its fierce grip. The kitchen cabinets slide in and out of focus. Hold still. I feel the knife score my skin in a broad curving X that intersects the great blister. I see the knife return to its place. My mother takes up the bottle and unstoppers it with her immaculate teeth pouring spirits into the palm of her left hand. She sets the bottle down and, dipping her index finger again and again in the pool, daubs alcohol onto the beating red X. Her stinging signature grows strangely cool. Having wiped both hands on her jeans, she lifts the bottle to receive the stopper from her wry lips and replaces it on the floor. Then she takes the lighter and in one smooth, rebounding wrist snap, flips off the top and rolls the flint with her thumb. With this ignition, am I suddenly suspended 18 inches above some boy's grossly distended shoulder? Am I concentrated to a point? With this ignition, am I shorn of pain's immediacy and able to see forth in every direction? My mother raises the flame with her left thumbnail to a height of three inches, and then, her mouth cracking into a full, dimpled grin, she brings the flame over to where one arm of a bloody cross commences in the middle of the boy's side. A blue flame runs quickly up the line, splitting into three directions at the bellied center of the X. It soon settles down, a flickering swath of yellow above an invisible base. The line of blood crackles and blackens, the taut triangles of flesh brown at the edges. As the heat rises, the tumor starts to stir and then to thrash, and with each new spasm, the flaps of skin separate a little bit more, revealing a milky blue membrane that begins to bubble as the flames lick across it. My mother unlocks the parlor door and returns with a bulky square, which she folds out into a cage the size of an upright piano, bamboo, with a wicker weave lashed to the cross pieces of the roof. She lights a menthol and goes through the pantry to the meat room, where I can hear her tear off a piece of butcher paper from the roll beside the bandsaw. She brings back a large rectangle that she places on the floor, tucking one white edge neatly under the boy's disturbed side. Her eyes are closed and the flame's gone out, but the hump continues to struggle, rocking his body back and forth. My mother stands up. She ashes in her breast pocket. She walks over to the stove, dons a canvas apron, and pours sesame oil into a cast iron spider. With an old dish towel draped over her arm, she sets this pan next to the toolbox and takes out a Lilliput flensing knife. When she has stropped it to satisfaction on the heel of her palm, she peels back the flaps of the boy's skin. One charred point hangs over his side and just touches the paper, revealing beneath a throbbing oblate sphere the size of a large cantaloupe or a small medicine ball, the raw meat and bone of the boy's shoulder. She stubs a cigarette out on the side of the spider and rolls up a flannel sleeve. And then my mother works her fingers around the edge of the trembling membrane and tries to prise the thing free, but it grips the bone fast. She gets a hat pin from the top tool tray and pokes the thing, gently at first, and in then an inch, two, causing it to relax a moment before it convulses with renewed violence. She notes the pause. When she jabs it twice in rapid succession, the blind mass all comes away at once, flopping wetly down next to the skillet 
and taking with it the center of my distant pain. A sigh escapes my mother. She wedges the critter between her apron knees and then gently, firmly, makes a shallow incision with the knife. Pulling up on the cut membrane, she passes the keen edge of the blade lightly back and forth against the line of attachment, so that as she rotates the creature, the glistening tissue falls slowly from it like a shroud, to reveal a pale, hairless, eye-shut head. The head is large and almost human, except for its color, which grows purplish, indigo blue. With the mouth and nose cleared, she sets the knife down and begins to tickle it through the rest of its quaking call, till at last the mouth gapes and twists in a fit of laughter, laugh after laugh that makes the complexion redden, the body bend and release like a bow. My mother picks up the spasmodic beast and returns to her flensing, humming some tuneless phrase under her breath. Without warning, it chomps down on her pinky and she gasps, bastard, almost drops it, has to go for the hat pin again, this time with less mercy. At last, the membrane lies on the floor. The creature has a fatty fish-like tail where I expect a neck. The whole thing shaped like a giant slug. My mother towels it off and, holding it gingerly with the cloth like a hot casserole, brings it to the door of the cage and gently rolls it inside. With a length of red silk string from a hank in her pocket, she ties the bamboo door to with a single bow knot. The creature is trembling and my mother drags the cage over to the window where there is some late morning sun. She stands in front of the cage for a long time, looking down. Forget I said that, she says quietly, and turns back. She takes up the wet casing and holding it over the spider, lops it into bite-sized pieces with the flenser till the pan is nearly full. A toothbrush scours out the last bit of membrane from under the boy's skin flaps. A roofing knife trims a tab of asphalt shingle to shape. A hand seats it beneath the flaps. Then, with a sailor's needle and some 12-pound test, my mother begins to draw the skin back together with large, looping, overhand stitches. Adkin, she says, and at the sound of my name, I am back in my body once more. Adkin, this is only temporary. We don't want the tissue to knit together. Not yet. My whole shoulder is on fire, and every muscle in my body is clenched. As she wipes the implements clean and returns them to the proper trays, I work to relax my muscles, group by group, letting the pain wash through me as I do. My mother lights another cigarette and humming once more, puts the apron in the hamper, the paper in the burn barrel and the fry pan on the back burner, low heat. The bottle goes back under the sink, though the jar of foul matrix gets reached up, I see, to the top of the fridge. The twine that binds my wrists is cut with the switchblade from her boot. And then my mother bends over me and takes the wet panties from my mouth. Adkin, she says, tousling my crew-cut hair. Go and say hello to your brother. That's from the Joy of Edge Tools. I'm going to play um, two last songs, and that'll be it for this week. <clears throat> Speaking of um, tin, 
tin playthings. Um, there's a cast tin circus that makes an appearance in this song. And it is written by, well, it's written by me. But it's written from the point of view of a guy in his 70s uh, for his two daughters as they're driving across country um, to a safari park where he's going to throw himself to the lions. That doesn't come out in the song, but it's, um, it's from an unproduced film that I wrote it for. And this, too, has a version of a sort of wishful thinking, a wishful version of the afterlife. It was strange when you were born Now you're stranger yet Accidents always fall to you You're dancing with no net Once plump with juice Baked into a yellow loaf All of us hungry Angry too No strangers to jokes Cast him, the Roman word for barn. And I was stinky clown. I hypnotized every beast in sight. Through 12 feet above the ground. Raisins once plump with juice baked into a yellow loaf. All of us hungry, angry too. No strangers to jokes. Overgrown grass, a substantial stone, saplings everywhere. Promise you'll leave petals and not thorns when I'm floating through the air. Free raisins, once plump with juice, baked into a yellow loaf. All of us hungry, angry too. No strangers to joke. It was strange when you were born 
now you're a stranger, yeah. Accidents always fall to you. We're all dancing with no Dancing with no Um, before I sing this last one, I just want to say thanks, um, first of all, to the Danish Agency for Culture and Castles for giving me some money to do these live streams and thereby lighting a fire under my ass. And um, Daniel for an online sound check. And what else? Um, I'm thinking about continuing this. Uh, the agency gave me money to do two and a half. <laughs> I'll do three, but they gave me um, money for three, but I'm thinking of continuing continuing this because it's useful, but probably not as frequently, um, say once a month. If you would like to support that, um, in the closing credits, there will be, um, the address of uh, PayPal, paypal.me slash Minka Hoist or patreon.com slash Minka Hoist. Um, if you want to support or just um, show some support. But this, uh, this last song um, was written with a fellow named Casper Lop and it's um, it's a completely made up story of um, two hitchhikers and their dune relationship. I did draw a lot on um, a career as a serial hitchhiker in my youth. I crossed the states from coast to coast 10 or 12 times, usually alone but sometimes with a, a boon companion or two. So one thing about the Greek underworld if you're planning a trip there. It's surrounded by a river of forgetfulness. And perhaps that's a good thing. If, you're, if you wind up in hell or you're returning from hell. But here on earth, Sometimes memories are all we have. A jeep stopped out so outside Poughkeepsie, and now we're pounding through the rain. The driver, he cursed like a gypsy. Time will take the train. We split that apple from your backpack. I stuck out my thumb to 
too late to backpack, backtrack. Our troubles just begun. A thousand roadsides, a thousand miles, a thousand sands along the way. Broken bottles, broken glass, broken nights, broken days. We smoked that gift from the deadhead. You fell asleep in your clothes. Old cigarette holes on the bedspread. I count the freckles on your nose. A thousand roadsides, a thousand miles, a thousand sands along the way. Broken bottles, broken glass, broken nights, broken days. But when you sing, good night, Irene, the skies begin to clear. Good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dreams. Before they disappear. They kicked us out by some river. You threw out a hook. While we waited for it to deliver something we somehow could cook. With unrecorded life The words I tried forming You'll never be a wife A thousand roadsides A thousand miles thousand signs along the way Broken bottles Broken glass Broken nights Broken day A thousand roadsides A thousand miles a thousand sands along the way Broken bottles Broken glass Broken dreams Broken days Thanks very much for this evening, for joining me. And uh, next week, same time, same station, Tuesday night, or Tuesday, um, I'll be 
doing more songs and readings under the theme of lullabies, and I promise to do Good Night Irene in its entirety. Good night, folks. Woo! Let's see. How do I do this? Good night.